Hello, my name is Sally Fink, and this is Court of Jewels, and I'm going to take you on a video tour of the show today. I've always loved costumes, miniatures, and anything shiny, and my hobby of making costumes has been going on for almost 50 years. It all began in 1973 with competition costumes for a science fiction convention in California and later segued into historical costumes for the Society for Creative Anachronism. My interests changed and I started writing novels, even though there were always more costumes in my head begging to be made, including a number described in my books. When I discovered realistic ball-jointed dolls in 2014, I realized I'd found the perfect costume mannequins. As they are poseable with perfect bodies and lovely faces, I indulged in making miniature outfits from history and media and my own fertile imagination. I chose the title Courts of Jewels for several reasons. Along with my love of glitz and glitter, I also love brilliant color, and jewels personify both. The jewels are not just shiny stones, they're also people, people in all the diversities of personalities and nationalities of their colors and clothing and lifestyles. With Courts of Jewels, I present to you a celebration of color and beauty sparkle and shine, and of people of the world and of fiction and fantasy. The fabrics came from my extensive stash from local fabric shops and from suppliers all over the U.S. and around the world. The furniture and table furnishings were made by my friend Cliff Keppel, by me, and my talented artists from the U.S., Asia, and Europe. I collected the small doll props from just about everywhere, again, all over the U.S. and the world. Some, such as the foodstuffs, were specially commissioned. Many were repurposed, thrift store finds. Most of the backdrops are shower curtains. You can find shower curtains with almost anything printed on them. The wide sequence streamers are table runners. The majority of ball jointed dolls are from Ipple House in Korea. Other companies include Doll Chateau, La Legend of Temps, Doll Zone, and Eve Studio. The ball jointed dolls are cast resin though the smaller animal balls are mostly 3D printed. The blushings, that is the face and body painting, were done by doll artists from around the U.S. Except where noted, I drafted, patterned, and created all the doll costumes in the show. This show is the culmination of two and a half years of work, and I enjoyed every minute of its creation. Jewels of the East. The majority of ball jointed doll companies are located in South Korea, China, and Japan, but they make relatively few dolls with Asian features. Bishun and Asa, wearing kimono outfits, are lovely exceptions. Their kimonos were patterned the same as their full size counterparts. The belts and over robes of brocade and embroidered nets are fantasy. They wear getta socks and sandals, which I made. Bashun holds a Japanese katana, a traditional sword. I made the weeping cherry tree from bare branches to which I taped thousands of pink blossoms. The Buddha was a fountain I found at a local craft store and sits on a woven rag basket sprayed with texture paint and covered in trailing vines. Science fiction jewels. Star Trek shaped my life. The original Star Trek series is the reason I met my best friend, the reason I got into competition costuming that later segued into historical costuming, the reason I wrote the fan fiction that later inspired me to write original works, and all of that eventually led me into ball jointed dolls as one thing builds upon another. After I saw the movie, I had to make the Doctor Strange costume. I'd found the Benedict Cumberbatch head sculpt years before, but the only Cumberbatch character I was familiar with at the time was Sherlock, and that costume just didn't interest me. When Doctor Strange came out, I said, okay, now I have a reason to get the face, which I then had painted by a doll artist in Texas. I commissioned the wig from an artist in Thailand, and the sling ring, belt ring, and belt slides were made by a local jewelry friend. I stained the clear plexiglass spell shields, which had been sold as coasters, with alcohol inks. I cut down a pair of boots and added the strapping. The tunic and vest are lightweight tensile denim, 
and I found a beautiful piece of red suiting wool for the cape. I discovered the, stink, the distinctive cape lining fabric on Spoonflower where it was being sold full size for cosplayers and had the artist print it one third size for me. I dyed white lace red and cut it apart for the embroidered motifs on the cape trim. And I cross hatched a velvet Christmas ribbon with a colored pencil for the contrast cape patches. This outfit took six weeks to make and the cape took about half of that. I made the next generation costume because I thought the elf doll would translate nicely into a Vulcan. This was an interesting costume to draft because except for the sleeves, no two pattern pieces are the same. Her communicator insignia is an earring and her collar pips scrapbooking brads. A few holiday seasons ago, Hallmark offered a Star Trek tricorder ornament, so then I had to make the original series costume to go with it. I digitized the tunic insignia and embroidered it out on my sewing machine. The Vulcan rose with all the iconic motifs, including the Itic and Ratatafan to far to pan embroidery, is my interpretation of a fan costume I saw online. When a friend of mine saw this costume, she said she knew both the man who'd made it and the man who'd worn it and sent them photos. Jewels of Entertainment. Few things are more entertaining to me than modern fashion, hence the ladies on the red carpet. The Met Gala gown is my tribute to Guo Pei, China's first haute couture designer. The ornate trim on the skirt and sleeves is from India. The pre precocious child star wears a lace overlay dress with a brocade bodice. The leading lady wears a strapless high-low hem gown with lace and rhinestones and a trailing sequin drape. The movie Rocket Man motivated me to make motivated me to make the Elton John costume from his salad days when he rocked glittery jumpsuits, rhinestone caps, feathers, and platform boots, the last specially commissioned. Getting the baby grand piano here from China was quite an adventure with the company that crafted it and the U.S. Postal Service, which destroyed the first one due to poor packaging. The company made and sent me the second one, which also arrived damaged but repairable. I added all the rhinestone glitz to glitz it up. An opera diva accompanies Elton in a gown made from a beaded and embroidered sari by award-winning Canadian doll artist Martha Bowers. The disabled guitarist in the wheelchair wears a shiny shirt and leather pants by an Etsy seamstress. The ballet dancers at the bar wear leotards from La Legend Attempts. The blonde doll is also from that company a limited edition sculpt from China that took nearly a year to get here. I ordered extra feet and was able to outfit an Ipple House doll for a second dancer. I made the bar from PVC pipe connectors and dowel rods. Jewels of the Desert, a fantasy interpretation of a wealthy desert merchant family at an oasis. The camel is from a large nativity set. The lady wears a silk gauzy coat and harem pants, gauze chemise shot with gold thread, beaded belt, and gold jewelry. Her husband is dressed in a satin shirt with gold cuffs, rich brocade vest, balloon pants, fancy turban, boots with curled toes, and a satin over robe that he's taken off. Tentatively petting the camel, their son wears a linen tunic and pants, striped vest and scope cap. The tassel tent shelters their foodstuffs, breads, oils, fruits, and coffee. And under the palm tree, they've spread out some of their wares, necklaces, chains, and beads. Jewels of my heart, the LaLaurie characters. 
Tales of the LaLaurie is my science fiction fantasy series written over a period of 30 years and published through Amazon. These seven ball-jointed dolls represent all the main and several secondary characters from the series. Gentling a young Thorse, Brady's wears a fancy open front crossover tunic with hanging shoulder decorations, fancy belt and suede pants. The Thorse, a horse-like animal with a trunk and cloven hooves, was reconfigured from a holiday reindeer decoration. Her song and the lion, when she was still human, modeled the outfits they made for one another in the first book. Her song wears a blue satin tunic with ribbon sleeves and suede leaves embellished with rhinestones. The lion wears a mauve satin tunic with embroidered collar cuffs and belt, also decorated in rhinestones. They carry fancy masks for a masquerade evening. Frau Vresch wears ceremonial Harvest Hall robes and a fan headpiece made of quilting cotton, lace, beaded trim, and hundreds of velvet and silk leaves. The findings on the headpiece are repurposed earrings and bracelets from my stash. Mapelane Hanan models a white and blue crystal encrusted cold shoulder gown with a layered overrobe and winged headpiece made of brocades, lace, sheer, hanging beads, chains, and scrapbook booking motifs. Lazaline, a clothing and costume designer, models a short jacket and slit skirt in turquoise damask, quilting cotton, and silver lace. And Rinanin, a singer and entertainer, wears a one-shouldered mottled gray satin gown with a purple sequin drape and lots of beads and trimmings. I cut down and fitted infant sandals for these dolls and drafted and made the lions and lazolines brocade slippers. And yes, the Lalore really like cats. The Court of Jewels. I wanted a scene that epitomized the show title and these two slightly odd doll chateau, ball jointed dolls seemed right for the king and queen of it all. They wear draped outfits of richly beaded fabrics. The king's skirt is metal mesh, the queen's halter a bit of shaped trim. The king holds a scepter made from the end of a curtain rod. The queen's orb is a Christmas ball and findings. The teaster that holds all the beads and drapes is a Sirocco spoon planner turned upside down. The throne was constructed of wood shelves covered in glitzy fabric, PVC pipes, knickknacks, and Christmas decorations. The bubble vases are filled with yards of molded string beads. crystal rhinestone, and peacock jewels. In 2020, I had the opportunity to purchase two amazingly sculpted mannequins that had once been part of the Phantom of the Opera when it was in residence at the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas. These mannequins, along with about 60 others, were originally dressed in authentic Victorian costumes and occupied opera boxes on the sides of the theater above the live audience. A friend in New England cleaned and repaired these ladies, and I further enhanced their makeup. I decided they were sisters and named them Dolly and Josephine Corset because of their hourglass Victorian figures. Josephine is a vision in glitz, wearing a corset embellished in crystals and a skirt of embroidered silver sequins draped over with a dripping rhinestone trim. Her shoulder and hip drapes are sequin table runners. I commissioned her huge Svarsky rhinestone necklace and from Fierce Drag Jewels in Rhode Island. Dolly is a purple jewel dressed in peacock motifs from her headpiece to her capelet, flowing sleeves and corset. Her costume features textured satin, velvet, embroidered netting, rhinestones, beaded appliques, trims and lace. And if you haven't figured it out yet, purple is my favorite color. Jewels of the Sea. A simple halter and belt, hip belt outfit of silver lace, pearls, beads, and trims for the Little Mermaid. Her tiny baby hides in the gold coral next to her, and their pet sea dragon, a limited edition resin art doll from Europe in the green seaweed. Instead of the expected shells and fish for this scene, 
I used foliage and decorations to suggest a fantasy water abode. Fantasy Jewels. In a magical forest, a meeting of the Fae, a blue fairy princess releases butterflies into the trees. The centaur guardian and his son watch over the proceedings. Queens of light and dark preside in front of a crystal and gold orb. The elves are represented by their queen and prince. Four little critters in this scene. A fennec fox, a blue baby dragon, and two fantasy goats. Lots of lace in these outfits. The fairy's little dress was shaped and stiffened with permanent fabric starch. Her wings are wired brocade and sparkle sheer. The centaur's trappings were constructed of laces, trims, chains, rhinestone buttons, and held in place with magnets. The black gown is brocade, lace, satin, and red rhinestones. The half moons in the headpiece are antique shoe clips. The white gown is embroidered bridal net over turquoise brocade. The wide collar was made from the pearl sleeve of a 1980s wedding gown from a thrift store. The lady elf wears quilt and cottons, pleather, and crushed velvet. The young man elf wears a lace crown and a lace cape. His belt, gauntlets, and greaves were heavily decorated in lace motifs and rhinestones. Tree started out as bare gold branches onto which I spent many hours gluing gold beads. The basis of the centerpiece is a hanging lamp turned upside down. I had a friend put together an articulated 3D wooden puzzle kit then sprayed it with so much gold paint and glitter that it froze in place, but it made a perfect receptacle for the glass orb. Entire piece is decorated with trims, flat gold pearls, and rhinestones. Fashion Jewels. The House of Fink, a 1920s fashion design studio. I've always loved the creations of Urte, which is what inspired this group of costume tombs, which were all based on period ga garments. I shipped the male doll to T. Tanav in Europe, and she constructed the tailored tuxedo outfit. The lady in the gold sequin dress has Marcel hair made famous by singer Josephine Baker. The mauve and lace fringe dress is accented with a rope of pearls and a feather boa. The lady on the fainting couch in the hammered satin gown with huge pink flower accents has probably had too much to drink. The purple satin gown has side drapes of embroidered netting called follow alongs. The black pedestal gown is made of satin, crinkled crepe, rhinestone trim, and scrapbooking motifs. The center gown is fashioned after Urte with its huge Kokoschnik headpiece, voluminous fabrics and fringe, though the crinkled column dress is more reminiscent of Fortuny's designs. And of course, there had to be a cocoon coat, which was constructed of a crushed velvet scarf and a lady's trico blouse from a thrift store and fake fur. The furniture was commissioned from European artisans. Most of the set pieces, the Victrola, telephone, even a Tommy gun, are from Asian doll suppliers. The 3D printed dachshund under the feigning couch is more interested in guarding his bone than anything else. Jewels of the Renaissance. I've been involved in the Society for Creative Anachronism for almost 40 years. So of course, I had to make Elizabethan and Tudor costumes. The real steel 15th century Milanese armor 
was commissioned from, from the amazingly talented Slava, Slava Kostyarenko in Russia, who also constructs full-sized armor and swords. The knight attends his lady, who is garbed in a late 1500s brocade gown with a split front skirt, revealing a decorated underskirt, a bodice and shoulder rolls and decorated silk sleeves. Her cuff edges and standing ruff are lace, a late 1500s innovation. Her headpiece is an English version of the French hood, a tiny carcanet or necklace, and a profusion of pearls decorate her ensemble. The early 1500s Tudor King wears a brocade doublet with paint sleeves and figured velvet pants, fancy blackwork cuffs, a jeweled chain of office, and a jeweled golden crown reflect his noble status. His meal consists of a meat pie, dates stuffed with almonds, cheese, bread, and fruit. The Tudor lady wears a bodice with elaborate sleeves, velvet on top with enormous false flat sleeves beneath. The blackwork cuffs of her smock show at the wrists. Her skirt is arranged over a farthingale and is split to display the forefront of the underskirt. Her gable hood features a jeweled filament, brocade lappets, and the velvet veils in back. Her lap dog begs for attention at her feet. The scholar wears a tootle style doublet and pants and a velvet robe with a fur collar. The wool hat worn by academics during this period later morphed into the modern mortar board. Carries a book of hours. The throne and table were made by an Etsy artist from the Ukraine. Jewels of France and England. I was inspired by the Versailles TV series to make these costumes from the court of Louis XIV. Richly adorned in gold lace, Louis wears a knee-length damask coat over a waistcoat, breeches, and a blouse with full sleeves and a cravat. Note the red heels on his shoes, which Louis introduced to his court in the late 1600s. The lady wears an off-shoulder round neck damask gown with a decorated bodice and open front skirt. They enjoy wine in a salon filled with works of art, including still lifes of flowers and busts on ornate pedestals displaying sculpted helmets in silver, gold, and copper. The lady and man in the aviary wear damask coupons from England in the 1400s. Hers, a long version with huge sleeves and a double collar. His, a shorter style with split bag sleeves over a high collared shirt. Her headpiece is a reticulated hennin or a scuffian. His is a rondelle with a coxcomb and a lyropipe. The man also wears a folly collar with bells and pointy toed shoes. The rich damask fabrics of their garments came from the Czech Republic. The little bird cages are tea light holders. Supporting jewels. I can't resist miniatures of any type, so not all the items I collected for the show were fantasy or historical, many were modern. That led to the courts of jewels, backstage set, where props are stored, a seamstress labors over a hot sewing machine, a carpenter and the food service lady take a break at the buffet, and shovel several show participants nosh or complain while waiting to go on stage. The steampunk Victorian lady wears a fitted corset, skirt of ribbon fabric trimmed in velvet panels, and a lacy half blouse. The little girl with the plate of cookies wears a more authentic Victorian child's dress with lace trimming and a silk sash. The anime boy with cat ears wears an embellished brocade shirt and shiny stretch leggings. On a dressmaker mannequin in the sewing area is a purple gown with a net skirt 
covered in ribbon roses. The outfits on the seamstress Carpenter, and the food service lady were commissioned and or purchased from Etsy artists. So I did construct the carpenter tool belt and collected all the one third size tools for it, and they all work. The props and foodstuffs came from all over, furniture from an artist in Russia. This is Western Pennsylvania, so there had to be a congratulatory sheet cake commissioned from a faux food company. And I cut down real cigarettes to make their tiny counterparts. A most purple jewel, the Iron Orchid. I made the full-size Iron Orchid costume in 1987 and competed it at Costume Con 5 where it won Most Beautiful Master Class and Best in Show Workmanship. The costume later spent seven years as part of a display at the Science Fiction Museum and Hall of Fame in Seattle, Washington. As I was designing outfits for the show, it occurred to me that it would be fun to reproduce one of my original costumes in miniature chose the Iron Orchid because it's one of my favorites. The small costume took about five weeks to construct because I had to recreate all the trimmings and appliques in miniature. I took photos of the full-size costume and reduced detailed shots to one-third size, then used these as templates to construct the trims and small appliques. I had scraps of the metallic fabrics I'd used on the original costume, the light purple sand and the dark purple majestic fabrics, and used them for the doll headpiece. I recreated the flocked corset fabric by cutting black velvet paper shapes with a Sizzix machine and gluing them on metallic tissue fabric. The satin skirt is cartridge pleated onto the corset, same as on the full-size outfit. I stained pearls with alcohol ink or dyed them with fabric dye. And unbelievable as it sounds, there are 86 yards of ribbon and 20 yards of gold beads on the small costume. Thank you for watching the video tour of my costume show, Courts of Jewels. Again, I'm Sally Fink, and you can see more of my costumes at www.sallycfink.com.